<laughs> and I, I, when I, I was reminded when she told me what happened, it's because, you know, that sometimes what happens is we do things out of habit. Out of habit, we went to the A terminal, we went to that terminal, there's only really one terminal, but there's two different, uh, it's divided in Tucson, it's a small airport, but, uh, but we go to where Southwest flies out of every, every single time, but habit just automatically, she went to that particular terminal with those particular gate. And I think sometimes in ministry, we do things, we put things in automatic and expect things to change. And we never, we never launch out. We never change the trajectory. Because, and we're at the, because I thought about this. We, I can stand the wrong terminal and say, "Oh, I hope it gets me to, I hope it gets me to Sacramento. I hope it gets me to Sacramento." But if that, if that, 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 if that gate doesn't take me to Sacramento, I'm not going to Sacramento. But ladies and gentlemen, um, when I last the other night when I began to talk about the evolution of the prophetic voice, I want to continue in that theme in that vein because I mentioned in my sermon on Monday night about how God called John the Baptist the greatest and obviously we have to put him in the pool of prophetic voices of his generation but when I think of other prophetic voices in the Bible I also I cannot I cannot neglect Samuel because the Bible says that none of his words fell to the ground or in other words, he operated in a place of accuracy unlike anybody in his generation. And if I and if I if I, I can't and if I leave out I can't leave out Samuel, nor can I leave out John, but then I can't leave out Elijah and Elisha with signs and wonders. And so over the last couple of months, um, I've been in an in-depth study of the book of Okay, praise Jesus. I guess they wanted an ad right there. Come on. But, but over the last couple of months, I've been in an in-depth study of the book of Exodus. And I was moved, I was moved to tears because there's something I want to tell you. I don't ever want to know the word so good that I stop weeping when I read it. I don't want to be so familiar with the word of God, it no longer touches me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's why the same stories can move me over and over and over and over again because there's a depth, there's a, there's a revelation. And I believe that this morning, the spirit of revelation is gonna come upon us. There's gonna be an impartation this morning of the spirit of revelation. How many want the spirit of revelation? And, I'm, when, I, and when I talk about that, and then you talk about the evolution of the prophetic voice, I was studying, and obviously, if you're studying through the book of Exodus, you're going to have to study the life of Moses. And although I knew it, I didn't know it. But all of a sudden, you, you talk about John the Baptist's greatness. You talk about the accuracy of Samuel, the signs and wonders of Elijah and Elisha. But there is a, there is a, there is a scripture in the book of Deuteronomy that, ran, that, that really burned in my spirit because it says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, and I'm reading from the NIV, it says, since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. Everybody say, no prophet has risen. How many know the prophets need to rise? How many know ministry needs to rise? How many know things need to rise? whom the Lord knew face to face. I've cried out, God, oh God, when I speak, let me speak your word. Let me be accurate. Oh God, let me be great in your eyes. But over the last couple of months, I've been crying out, God, I want to see your face. Because there was something about Moses Something there was because we can have accuracy. We can be a great speaker. But I don't know about you, but I want to know his face. I want to talk to him face to face. Because you know, because 
God talked to Moses face to face, he didn't need to interpret what God said, nor did he misinterpret what God said. Because we live in a day and age when, when people are prophesying things that God didn't say. And so without clarity, Pastor Troy, without clarity, uh, the, without clarity, then there only is confusion. And when it's said that God knew, he knew him face to face, that means, see, because my wife, I don't need an interpretation because Meliana gets in my face. Come on. You know what I'm saying? I don't need to call Pastor Co and say, hey, can you interpret what Meliana said to me? Come on. I know exactly what she says. But I believe that there's a generation arising. There doesn't have to be one man, one woman. There doesn't have to be one person whom God speaks face to face. Why can't there be a, a company that arises where God talks to face to face? So then I've got to ask myself this question. What was it about Moses that attracted the face of God? What was there, Pastor John Truesdale, that attracted his face? And I've been on this journey of, of discovering there, there were things in Moses' character because when I was here with Red Hill in January, I talked about Cain. And there's a scripture in Jude that says, do not follow the way of Cain, nor go in the air of Balaam, nor the rebellion of Korah. And when I, I talked about Cain, I'm not going to talk about it this morning, but what I am going to talk about is this, the era of Balaam, because Balaam was a prophet. He was a prophet. But there are people who operate in spiritual gifts, and their, and their character is corrupt. Because I want spiritual gifts. I want, I, I want to operate in spiritual gifts, but I don't want corrupt character. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's why we need to get baptized in the character of God. That's why we, need, we need cry out, oh God, give me your character. Give me your character. Give me your holiness. Give me your righteousness. Give me those, your characteristics. But what was it? What was it about Moses that attracted God's face? And I'm going to share in this, in this first session about five different things that I believe that attracted, that attracted the face of God to Moses. And the first one is this. The first one, I want you to write this down. I believe the reason why Moses had such clarity is because one reason, he was humble. I have to tell you right now, I'm in a place right now where I'm crying out, God, oh God, give us more humility. Because we're crying out for revival. But before revival ever comes, we got to cry out for humility. And if we'll cry out for humility, he was humble. And I, be I believe that because of his humility, and because of that humility that he, 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 that God was attracted to that because it says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it's very interesting that now the man Moses was very humble more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. How would you like God to say that about you? But the interesting thing is he had to write it about himself. Oh, come on. Are you sure you want me to write this down? Come on. Are you sure you want me to write this? I mean, this, uh, this looks kind of not, but the thing is, is no wonder God spoke face to face with him. Because there was a level of humility that no matter how great he became, no matter how powerful, no matter what he did, he, did, he was never impressed with himself. Because sometimes we can build a ministry and get impressed with ourselves instead of building our relationship with God. Because we understand he's bigger than any ministry. He's bigger than any church. He's bigger than any organization. He's bigger than we can ever imagine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this humility that Moses possessed also caused him this. Because I don't know about you, but, you know, Melian and I, in 2021, we, we started a church in Tucson. Now, I've never pastored in my life. I'm not a pastor. And um, I can tell you something right now. 
um, if I would have known what I had to go through to plant the church, I wouldn't have planted the church. <laughs> but I think I planted the church so I could have a heart for pastors, you know, and I could share some of their struggles. I know what they're talking about. Because I think what, what humility, how you demonstrate humility is patience and tolerance. And I'm not talking about being tolerant of sin, but tolerant of people's errors and mistakes. Because I've seen so many, so many leaders get so upset with people that, that, had, that were immature or made a mistake that they write them off. They write them off and say, no, you're, you're, dis, you're disqualified. You're, you, you, can't, you can't lead. And I, and I realize that Moses, in the context of Numbers 12, 3, his own sister and his brother were undermining his leadership. Come on. Are you hearing me? And instead, and see, because sometimes when people attack us personally or misrepresent us, we want to confront. And, and I love what Moses does. Before he ever confronts, he prays. Oh, come on. He prays. He intercedes. He, he gets down on his knees and he cries out. Come on. He cries out. To, uh, we learn from our superintendent about the power of prayer. And I, and I, I can tell you right now, I, every single time that Moses was attacked by his own people, he was constantly on his face, not asking God to destroy them, but asking God to heal them. Asking God to de de deliver them. Asking God, because sometimes what can happen, we can have people in our churches that are very, very difficult to deal with. We can have even leaders that are very difficult. But how many will be, have, be humble enough to get on your knees? Come on, to get on your knees and go, God, you've got to help me. And I want you to bless them. It's the power of humility. And, and I, I think it was humility that qualified Moses as a prophet. Because I, I think that is the qualifier. That's what made him a prophet of God. No wonder God spoke to him face to face. I mean, his own people. He goes, he goes down. I mean, he's, he goes up the mountain to get the law. And, and because there's no law in the camp... They've only been a few months out of Egypt, and now while he's gone, they're running around a calf. Because here's what happens. We live in a culture that puts freedom above law. See, we worship freedom. And, and then, but you can't have real freedom without law. Because, then, then, because if you have freedom without law, you'll have disorder. And so now the whole nation of Israel is in disorder. And so Moses hears about it, and God wants to destroy them. And But what do we see the prophet doing? We see him on his knees crying out, oh God, God, don't destroy them. Come on. Don't destroy your people. I've got to pastor these people. I've got to love these people. I've got to get them out from where they're at, and I've got to get them in the promised land. I can't quit on them. Come on, are you hearing me? That's why I want to know God face to face. Humility. But the other thing that I think Moses possessed was this. It was justice. Everybody say justice. Do your neighbors say justice. That justice was a characteristic in Moses even before he ever encountered God at the burning bush. How do I know this? Turn with me to Exodus chapter 2 verse 11. Listen to what it says. Now it came to pass. I'm reading from the New King James now. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. That he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. Everybody say, looked at their burdens. I'm going to step down here. I, I want to step down here. I got the microphone. <laughs> he looked at their burdens. What does that mean? What that means is he looked at the conditions of his people. And this is what happens. I never want to be so mighty that I stop looking at people's burdens. Oh, come on. 
that I not that I stop walking among the people. Be, because guess what he's doing? He's he's lived in a in a in a bubble of of Egyptian wealth, and now when he's grown, when he's mature, Meliana, this is exactly what happens. He decides I want to go look at the sufferings of my people. And when he sees the sufferings of his people, something sparks on the inside. See, minute, real ministry doesn't just begin because you heard a testimony. Real ministry begins when you get a burden. And, and a, see, because a burden won't leave you. An idea can leave you. A suggestion may leave you. But a real burden from the Lord will not leave you. And really, really what happened is he began to get a burden for his people. And I have to tell you, I have a burden for the state of Hawaii. I have a burden for the state of Hawaii. I have a burden because there's things been prophesied over this state that look like it's never going to come to pass. There's things that been, there's things that are happening in the state that are absolutely politically wicked and demonic. But there's got to be somebody that rises up with the spirit of Moses on them, and we look at the burdens of the people. They're enslaved, and, and all of a sudden. He witnesses an Egyptian beating another Hebrew. And in the 40 years that I've been saved, I've always heard this, that Moses made a mistake or Moses murdered an Egyptian and it was seen as a scar instead of looking at what the Bible says because God never said that. Because God was awakening something in Moses, a sense of justice. Because without a sense of justice, you cannot be a prophet. Are you hearing me? That it is wrong, it is wrong. In other words, I'm going to call evil what is evil. Come on. I'm not going to sit back and just let somebody harm another person. Oh, come on. I feel like preaching right now. Because sometimes what we do is we allow evil to continue and say, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to, I want to just let them, let them get abused. I want to let them change their sexuality. I want to let them change their identity. I want to let, and we cannot afford to do that, ladies and gentlemen, because let me just tell you, we got to look at the oh. We can't because, because the oppressor can't continue to oppress. There's a sense of justice that's awakened. There's humility and there's justice. Now, how do I know that? Because, I, I mean, all my life I've heard, oh, yeah, that was, a, that was a scar on Moses' life. That was a scar on what he did. But sometimes we define theology by what someone says, by rather what the Bible says. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, I believe it's verse 27, I, I, it says, by faith he left Egypt. Didn't say by fear. Didn't say because he murdered. Didn't say because he made a mistake. Didn't say because Pharaoh didn't like him and the people didn't like him. He said, by faith he left it, fear, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. So God was stirring him on the inside before he ever encountered God at the burning bush. How many are getting stirred on the inside this week? How many are getting stirred on the inside? I pray that by the end of the night, you get a burden from God. Because when you get a burden from God, you'll have the longevity. It doesn't matter if people mistreat you or treat you well. Because you have a burden from God, you'll stay oh. So, he says, he endured, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. And so, because he saw the, he saw something more than the pleasures of Egypt. He saw something more than being a prince. He saw, oh God, I'm your call. He saw his calling. A sense of justice. The third thing I want to talk about. You've got the, you've got humility. You've got the sense of justice. The fourth thing, I want, uh, the third thing, excuse me, turn to, turn to Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. It says these words. Then the Lord said to him, get up early and confront Pharaoh 
as he goes to the river and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Let me just tell you, don't forget what I'm going to tell you because this lines up with justice. A man or woman of God, especially a prophet of God, has to stand in the way of evil. Everybody say, stand in the way of evil. In other words, I'm standing in the way of evil, and I'm not going to let evil pass. He went out in the morning, and he confronted evil. He confronted Pharaoh. You know, a lot of times, as leaders, we don't want to confront. Because we'll, we'll think they won't like us. We'll think they may persecute us. Moses didn't care. He didn't, he didn't want to be liked. He wanted to see his people set free. And if we really want to see people set free, then we are going to stand in the way of evil. Because as long as I and my wife are alive, and I, I'm so thankful I got a microphone at this generation, because I get the privilege of standing in the way of evil. Because a lot of times we just limit the prophetic to just personal prophecy, and we're, that's going to happen in a few moments. I love that encouragement, but, but, but what I believe that part of the prophetic voice is we're standing in the way of you. You're not doing that in my town. You're not doing it in my city. You're not doing it in my state. You're not doing that in my generation. I'm not letting it happen. I'm, letting, I'm not letting the tyrant rule. I'm not letting the tyrant oppress God's people. I'm not letting people going to hell when I can do something about it. Come on. You may be saying, you may be saying, I'm just one lady, I'm just one man. But you know what? You're, Moses was one man, one man with the power of God, one man that God spoke face to face. He stood in the way of evil. Because if we don't stand in the way of evil, evil will pass. In other words, he's not going to let evil pass by him. You're going to have to go through me, bro. This is what's going to have to go through me. Because because we don't understand how evil evil is. Sometimes we can live in the bubble of our churches and don't understand what evil evil is really what it does. Now, I can tell you this. He wasn't afraid of Pharaoh's reaction either. He wasn't afraid of Pharaoh to throw him in jail or kill him. He didn't. I'll stand in the way of evil. The fourth thing that Moses did was this. Because when Moses had that encounter at the burning bush, Melian, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, what I love about it is that Moses said in chapter 4, verse 13 of Exodus, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Everybody say, please send someone else. Now, I'm going to look at this much differently than most think. Can I tell you something? Most, Moses wasn't being reluctant. Moses wasn't being disobedient. What Moses was doing is, you got the wrong guy. I'm not the guy for this job. Because when, you're think, when you think you're the guy, you know, when you think you got it all together, come on, because you just had an encounter with God, you think you're all that, you know what? You're the wrong guy. But when you tell God, I can't do the job that you called me to do, I, I don't even have, I, I haven't graduated from high school, I don't have a PhD like Pastor Terry Wong, come on, I have a PhD from Yale, I mean jail, come on, that's what I got. That, that's where I got my PhD from. But ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you right now, when you understand, you can do it on your own. God looks at you and say, you're the guy, you're the woman, you're the person that I've chosen because I know that you're going to have to rely on me at every moment and every second and every hour for everything. Come on. Can I give God a shout of praise right now? I can't speak. I can't do this. I can't write. I can't spell. That's the truth, Esther. <laughs> because we talk about relying on the Holy Spirit, but we have a tendency to rely on our talent. 
because it's easier to rely on my talent than it is to rely on the Holy Spirit. But I can tell you this. I can't. I remember there's a verse of scripture in Genesis where Joseph was delivered out of prison. And he's still in shackles. And Pharaoh says this to him. I heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Wow. I'm pretty I'm something. Boy, I can interpret dreams. At that moment, Joseph has to make a decision. Joseph has to make a decision. Because the man that I'm standing in front of can deliver me out of this problem that I'm in. He can get me out of these chains. He's got, he can, he can do a lot of things for me. See, when you're humble, you don't manipulate. When you're humble, you don't manipulate your gift for your own gain. When you're humble, you understand the gift is not for me. The gift is to serve. And it's not necessarily to serve just my people. It's to serve the world. It's to serve the unsaved. It's to serve my neighbor. And here, Joseph is placed in this place where he, okay, now the ball's in my court. It's in my court now. I know what I'll do. I'll make some stipulations. Well, Pharaoh, I'll interpret your dream. But first of all, I want you to put that woman in jail that accused me of raping her. And then top of that, in fact, I want you to send a garrison of soldiers over to Israel and put my brothers in prison. They don't interpret the dream. But Joseph doesn't do that because he understands my gift is to serve Pharaoh too. Jesus. And he says something. He said to Pharaoh, when the ball's in his court, he says, I can't. I can't. Melly and I speak 300 times a year. Travel all over the world. I can't do that. I can't keep up the, that pace. I cannot. I, I can't. See, I, I believe that when we get to that place where we say, God, I can't. That's when God's anointing, that's when God's power, that's when God's favor, that's when God's glory, that's when God's presence, that attracts the face of God. When you say you can't do it, that attracts my favor, that attracts my face. When you say I, I don't have the ability to deliver them people out of slavery, I don't have the ability to rescue those people out, uh, out from bondage from Pharaoh, I don't have the ability. When you begin to operate, oh God, God says you're the guy, you're the woman, you're the person. He says, I can't. But God will. Can we get to the place? Can we get to the place, ladies and gentlemen, where we can say, I can't, but God will. I can't, I can't grow my church, but God will. I can't, I, I can't disciple any, I can't even write a book. I can't spell, but God will. I, I can't accomplish what God wants me to do. I cannot fulfill my destiny in my own strength, but God will. Is there anybody that believes that? Is there anybody in the house that believes that? So when Moses began to say, God, I can't speak, he was not trying to be disobedient. He was just demonstrating his humility that I'm not qualified. Can I just tell you, John Harkey is not even ordained. 
I asked Pastor Terry to ordain me. He said, you don't have paperwork. Felt like I was in immigration. Come on. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Maybe they'll ordain me tonight. Just pray. Pray for me. Maybe they'll ordain me tonight. <laughs> But yet, I'm standing behind here. And yet, I'm standing behind this pulpit. What, because it's not me. Are you hearing me? And we got to get to that place where God, you know where I came from. You know where I came from. I can't. I mean, my own, Moses' his own people didn't even want him to be the leader. He, all he's doing is trying to, trying to deliver them. I mean, when he, when he, when he murdered the Egyptian, and we can, we can argue that doctrinally or theologically about whether he did the right thing or not, but according to Hebrews, he, he did the right thing. But, because he had a sense of justice. But, what we do know is that when he did try to rescue his people, they didn't want him as a leader. What do you do when your own church don't want you? <sighs> they don't want you. You go into a tailspin of depression and decide to go on a six-month sabbatical. And then six months later, you backslid. Because you got out from under the anointing and the calling of God on your life. Because you allowed the rejection of somebody else to determine your destiny and your future. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Instead of going, instead of going to God, getting on your knees and saying, God, I can't do this. But I know you can. I know you can. You got the wrong guy. But you chose me. Come on. I'm not trying to be reluctant here, but I need some grace. I, I, because God doesn't mind you being transparent and honest. Because sometimes what we get, this is what I love about this district. This is what I love about the Hawaii district. There's no pretense. We are who we are. Come on. Some, some text shows up in his slippers sometimes, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know who we are. We're not, we're not pretending. We don't have nothing to prove because we're not in competition. We're not, we're not in competition to one another. We just want the power of God. We just want a generation delivered. Wrong guy. And I remember, you know, this, this happens to me all the time, about, about once a month when I planted that church. It was okay traveling. The prophet's here. Picked me up. In fact, the, my driver, Pastor Kevin Brown, has got to call me to wake me up, you know, <laughs> or else we wouldn't have been in church last night. Because <laughs> Iceland caught up with me. Come on. I was in my room frozen. Come on. And he called you, where are you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but when I started pastoring, at least once a month, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. And then I, you know, and then this is what I do. I, then, I, then I find friends that reinforce what I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That gets you in trouble because you'll always find somebody that, that reinforces your foolishness. <laughs> You're always going to find people like that. And then I, I'm reminded, I can't. But God will. When that hit me, when that, when that hits me, ladies and gentlemen, I realized, no wonder God spoke the face to face to Moses. Because he would never lose that. He would never lose that childlike faith, as our brother Ron said last night. He never lost that part of his life. The fifth thing is this. I want you to write this down. The prophetic tradition echoes 
we demand for freedom. You guys listen to what he said in Exodus 9-2. If you refuse, he's confronting Pharaoh, if you refuse, if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back. In other words, I'm not letting you hold them back. How many don't want to be held back? Because any leader, leaders shouldn't hold other people back. I'm so thankful for my pastor, James Morocco, who did not hold me back, who has done everything to give me a platform of ministry, who's done everything to, to see that the call of God on my life gets fulfilled. Big, big, because in order for you to multiply, you can't hold people back. Because the moment you hold them back, they never become what they possibly could become. No wonder God spoke to him face to face because he wasn't going worried about whether someone would be better or prophesy it better or preach it better or sing it better or build it better or have a bigger ministry than that. He didn't know wonder because he wasn't going to. Oh. I remember he said this. I mean, I mean, in Numbers 11, he, he. You know, I mean, there's these two guys, me, dad, and L dad, they're prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, you know, he's he like, goes to Moses, he starts complaining about Moses. To Moses, about me, dad, and L dad prophesying. Because they weren't a part of the 70 elders, so, so because they weren't a part of the group, the clique, that disqualifies them. And, and Moses goes, are you jealous for my sake? In other words, do you think I'm intimidated about God using me, dad, and L dad in the camp? In fact, I'm really excited about that because I want a whole company of men and women prophesying because I like them better when they're prophesying instead of complaining. <laughs> Oh, come on. That's why I don't like when somebody said, I don't like this prophetic stuff. Well, the Holy Spirit likes it. I'd rather have a church full of, full of people prophesying than a church full of complainers. You know what I'm talking about. Come on. He says, he says are you jealous for my sake? In other words, what he's saying is, I'm not so insecure in who I am. That if God uses somebody else in a more powerful, profound way, it's not going to change what I'm going to do. Because I'm already, I, I'm secure in who God has made me. So I don't have to be intimidated by somebody who has a great ministry because God's blessed them and I want, I want to celebrate their success like we learned from Pastor Ron last night. And what Moses was doing, he was celebrating the success of me, dad, and El dad, Miliana. Now, hear what I'm going to tell you right now. Don't forget what I'm going to tell you. Because I never had seen this before. Joshua says that. Because what he's doing, he's projecting something on Moses that is misrepresenting his heart. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Joshua have a successor? Maybe the reason Joshua didn't have a successor was because of that incident in Numbers 11. which said maybe he felt so insecure. He, because after Joshua, we have judges, Pastor Lauren. Come on. We have confusion. Because that's what we have to reproduce. 
That's what we have to multiply. That's what we have to do. That's why we need church growth. That's why we need. That's why we need pastoral training. That's why we need these things in order so that we can reproduce and grow. Come on. But Joseph, Joseph was never, ever, ever able to pass on the mantle that was given him. I mean, I mean excuse me, Joshua. Joshua was never able to pass on the mantle that was placed upon him. And so what happened? Look what. Are you jealous for my sake? And then he said something. I wish God's, I wish all of God's people were prophets and that God would put his spirit on them. The man that spoke to God face to face was asking a prayer. Because everything that Moses said came to pass. Everything that he ever said came to pass. Even to the point where it took him a few thousand years, he did go into the promised land and stood at the Mount Transfiguration looking at the promise. He had to go up in heaven and come down again to do that. But I want to say this to you. Everything he said came to pass. Now, even when he said, I wish that all God's people were prophets, that God would put a spirit upon them, Numbers 11.25, I believe. And, and, and what, it, what that did is that word was fulfilled. That word was fulfilled. It's, it's, it, is the, it is the core, it is the core verse of this movement. Is the core verse of the assembly of God. Is the core verse in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So oh, come on. And, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In the last days. That, that's the core verse of our movement, the assemblies of God. And I can tell you something right now. We cannot let that die. We cannot let that die. We cannot let that die. Because what has happened is we become culturally and spiritually acceptable rather than acts too acceptable. Are you hearing me? And so we're worried about whether a new visitor comes in and, 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 and comes in and then if they see us prophesying, they might get scared or something. You know what I'm saying? That's not New Testament. That's not in the Bible. That's not truthful. You know what we need? We need to prophesy. We need to speak the mind of God. We need to, we need to get humble. We need to, to begin to cry out, oh God, lift, me, lift us up so we can be a voice in your generation. Can I hear an amen right now? Give God a shout of praise in the house. I remember the other night, you know, we... I want to do things out of the box, and so the other night we were at church, and a group of Muslims came into our church, and I want to tell you why they came in, not to disrupt the service. They came in because they wanted a prophetic word. And then the gentleman gets on the phone and calls his sister from Iran, gets her on the phone, and has me prophesied over her. And she's weeping over and over again. And I said, God, God, I want to hear you. I want to bring your kingdom into places where nobody would expect your kingdom to show up. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a day and age where we've got to stand and not let evil get past us. Are you hearing me? We have to, we have the, we have to be, there has to be some Moseses that arise in this generation that know God face to face. Because if you know God face to face, you know, you notice nobody's prophesying who's going to be the next president. Last time they missed it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? But when you know God face to face, you know who's going to be the next president. I'm sorry to say that. But it's the truth. 
When you know God's face to face, you don't have to worry about whether you missed it or not. When you got 50-50, you know, it's 50-50. It's not 50-50. Moses wasn't 50-50. He's on one day, off the next. Come on. Even when he had a bad day, he was still on. Even when he lost his voice, he was still on. Come on. Hey, come on. Even when he couldn't talk, he still was on. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we need those things. Humility. The first one was humility. The, se the, 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 the second one is the, is the need for justice. The third one is to stand in the way of evil. This, the, the fourth one is understanding. You got the wrong guy. That, that, that Lord, you're humble enough to say you're not the. I'm not the one. And the and the fourth and the fifth thing is that we need to demand freedom. Can we give God a shout of praise right now?